Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Gerard Ross. I'm one of the medical legal advisors for the MDU, and today I'm joined by my colleagues, Dr. Ed Andesoma and Dr. Nicola Leonard. And today we're going to be talking about managing complaints. And the aim of this is really just to give a foundational discussion of, the, of some of the issues that we see in people dealing with complaints. We're also aware that sometimes you have to deal with patients and relatives acting unreasonably or even threateningly. And that is a topic that we're aware of. It's something we hear from our members a lot and we talk to our members about it a great deal. And we've got another webinar coming up later on this year, probably the next month or two, uh, which is going to address that specific topic. Anyway, I digress. Today, I plan to talk for about 40 minutes. Um, and um, at the end of that time, um, uh, we'll try and answer the questions that you relate to us as a panel. So please um, do look at the um, uh, questions drop down box on GoToWebinar and um, use that to ask your questions. Please also try and make sure they're as focused as possible. The more focused your questions are, the more likely it is we're gonna be able to address them for you. Remember also that we're going to be doing this, or please be reassured, we'll be doing this anonymously. So there are no silly questions, there really aren't. And even if you do ask a silly question, we won't uh, use anybody's name. At the end of it, um, uh, you will be able to get a certificate of attendance if that's something you want for your appraisal. Um, the, the team will be sending them out at the end of the week, probably. And um, I think we can just crack on if that's all right. Um, so. What we're intending to cover today is, um, if my slides will move on, we're going to be looking at frequency of complaints, how they impact upon staff, why they're important, how you recognise a complaint, how the best way to acknowledge and investigate a complaint, how you respond to a complaint, fundamentally important, how do I plan for a meeting for a complaint? And, and what if the complaint is not, not resolved? For those in the audience who are hospital doctors or hospital um, work in hospitals, a number of these steps will be handled by your employing trust or, or your health board. But the importance, the, uh, the impacts, the responses and meetings will still be relevant to you. So whilst I will be covering some things in the presentation that are not directly relevant to you in hospital practice, please do stick around for the latter part of the talk because in our experience, writing a good complaint response is crucial to minimizing the risks of progression of a complaint. And that's something I'll be talking as well about as well, how things can move on from just a complaint uh, as we sometimes see them. So how common are complaints? Well, as you can imagine, complaints are common. We see roughly 210,000 complaints um, uh, toward to the NHS a year. And uh, of those, about 40% are made up of hospital and community services uh, medical staff. There's about 572 um, individual complaints a day in the NHS. And in primary care, 41% of the complaints are about GPs or, or, or dentists, in fact. So what do people complain about? Well, um, 12% of the complaints are related to clinical treatment, 14% are about communications, and 13% are related to staff and their alleged attitudes, behaviours, or, or values that are displayed. Um, and in, in the profession, about 36% of complaints are, are made about practitioners, and 26% of complaints are made about admin staff, including receptionists. In secondary care, um, I'm sorry, this actually includes clinical treatment, 28% of the complaints are specifically about clinical treatment, with 21% related to communications and 14% related to, again, staff, uh, the attitude or behaviour or values of staff. 41% of the complaints are about medical staff and 23% of complaints are made about nursing staff. The important thing that we see is that complaints are really stressful. Um, they are stressful not just for patients, but for those being complained about and for those who have to investigate their 
the complaints are being made. We've done a little bit of research with our members um, uh, looking at the impact of complaints personally. So this isn't looking at the impacts on their professional role, but on the, the, their personal lives in general. 40% of the people we asked were GPs, 47% were, were consultants, and about 9% were, were trainees. Complaints have a, had a significant personal impact on between a quarter and a third of doctors, uh, with many more being impacted to a lesser but still notable degree. In terms of involving their MDO, we, we noticed that GPs were particularly good, in fact, at um, letting us know when they had a complaint, which we're always happy to be involved with. But interestingly, consultants um, and trainees to an even greater extent were, were much less good at involving us in, in complaints, uh, which for us as, as advisors dealing with complaints on a day-to-day -day basis is, is a little bit worrying because complaints can develop. Just from that initial single complaint, multiple uh, medical legal things can can occur. And whilst it's true that consultants in NHS practice, um, the trust or their health board will manage complaints for them to a great to a great degree, they may not always manage it uh, manage it well. And an upset complainant is much more likely to go elsewhere. For instance, the GMC with their complaint. It's a fundamental point for us that it may only be a complaint, but doctors are are vulnerable. And this vulnerability is something that we call we call multiple jeopardy. Um, we're often, as as consultants, as GPs, as practitioners in, in, in general practice, we're often wrapped up in our jobs. I mean, it takes us a, a long time to to get to the position we're in. And when a complaint is made, it can feel quite personal uh, and quite wounding. The major concern that we have, though, is that we never know how a clinical contact uh, that has resulted in a complaint might develop. And these are some of the ways that we see issues develop. So we spend a lot of time uh, as juniors worrying about um, uh, being sued, a suit in, in a civil, civil claim and negligence. And that's certainly a possibility, but usually in the NHS, you'll have it the NHS um, uh, Litigation Authority, or uh, CNS GP in England, uh, looking after claims, claims and negligence. Or in hospital, you'll have the clinical negligence scheme for trusts. So that's usually less an issue for doctors, but things like disciplinary investigations, GMC investigations, coroner's inquests, all of these things can, can go on at the same time that you are having to try and deal with a complaint. Criminal investigations, thankfully, are not very common, uh, and when they do occur, they tend to take primacy over the other processes. But all of these things can run, and you can find yourself as a doctor having to give responses on a complaint in the knowledge that the person is also complaining to the GMC or has raised an issue with the coroner. So in terms of uh, importance, doctors and nurses are obligated to, um, to respond to complaints. And that's something that the CQC require um, from registered uh, providers. Um, they can be a source of learning and a drive to service improvement. And it's something that's always worth bearing in mind when when faced with a complaint um, in your practice or in your in your hospital. The obligations as regards complaints are set out in um, uh, the English regulations here, the local authority, social services, national health service complaints, mouthful, uh, sorry, that regulations from 20, 2009. There are similar regulations in all of the devolved jurisdictions as well. The GMC are very clear that uh, in good medical practice, they say that you must cooperate with formal inquiries and complaints uh, procedures. So how do we recognise a complaint? So there's a simple true or false question for you. 
something need not be treated as a complaint when the complaint has no basis and is clearly unreasonable. So have a think about that. Well, the answer to that is, is false, and I'm sure a lot of you would have known. A complaint or concern is an expression of dissatisfaction about an act, omission or decision of NHS England. Again, this is the English, the English definition. Either verbal or written, and whether justified or not, uh, they require a response. Similar um, definitions are uh, available in the, other, in the other jurisdictions. This is something that we see um, quite frequently in terms of um, uh, uh, practices, particularly all formal complaints must be in writing. Well, again, complaints can be split uh, into two categories. There are oral complaints, which can be resolved within one working day to the satisfaction of the complainant, and these can be considered informal. Uh, but written and oral complaints not resolved within one day, these are all considered as formal complaints and must be handled with, in accordance with the regulations. So all formal complaints um, do not have to be in writing. They can be given uh, orally or verbally from a complainant. So what about the practice points? Well, we think it's worthwhile that all staff who interact with patients must be able to recognise a complaint. And this conforms with the approach set out with the Parliamentary and, and Health Services Ombudsman. Um, let's, I'm sorry, I'm having a couple of difficulties with the slides there. It's important that staff dealing with complaints listen carefully, uh, confirm the cl complainant's concerns and the issues to be investigated. It's important that they ask the complainant what they're hoping to achieve um, with their complaint. Is this something that can be resolved straight away? If it's appropriate, try and manage their expectations and explain what is possible and what is not possible. Explain how, how long the process is likely to take. Be open and realistic. And I think this realistic section or realistic is an important word here. Don't bind yourself to an impossibly tight time scale in trying to respond to a complaint. It may not be easy for you to investigate a, a, a complicated multi limbed complaint within 10 days. And we often see the practices will suggest they'll have a response out within quite a tight time frame that isn't required from the um, the complaints regulations. Agree that how you're going to keep the complaint updated, however, it's important that if you're not going to get it done quickly, that you tell them uh, how you'll update them and how often you're going to update them. And also take the time to explain what will happen next. So let's think about, about this complaint, if we could. It's a patient who's recently been discharged from hospital, having had an operation to remove bowel cancer. They've been left with a stoma. They want to know why they weren't referred when they were seen earlier, um, and whether if wanting to know if that referral, if it had occurred, if that might have resulted in not having a stoma. The district nurses are being are, are involved with this, and they've given the patient a list of things they needed to help. Uh, the patient in managing their stoma, but the patient is expressing some difficulty in um, in getting what they require from the practice, uh, and this has only been resolved in getting uh, an emergency appointment. And clearly, that's not what what you would want uh, from a practice uh, if you're in this in this position. In terms of the next stage, having received a complaint, the important thing is to think about how you acknowledge a complaint. And complaint acknowledgements have to be done within uh, three working days. And they must give the complainant an opportunity to discuss the complaint um, and uh, indicate how the complaint will be investigated. So that's how we acknowledge a complaint. And let's 
in, uh, be aware, I think, or, or something to, to be aware of is to realize that this opportunity for communication is really important. It's more than just an opportunity for you to, to say, we're sorry that you felt the need to complain. We'll respond to your concerns within 10 days. So it's more than that. This is an opportunity for the practice to consider an empathetic response. I'm sorry to hear about your diagnosis and the concerns about the delays to your treatment. I understand that your concerns were that you may have been referred to hospital sooner, and I'll investigate that, that concern. So it's setting out what the practice will do as a result. I know you'll need to seek care from the practice while, uh, while I do this, and I reassure you your care will not be affected. Patients are often anxious that the practice will in some way discriminate against them because they've, they've made a complaint. Obviously, this isn't true, but there's no harm in flagging that up to the patient earlier on. And then they go on to say, I've set out below how I plan to investigate your complaint. Please get in touch with us if you feel there are other people I should speak to. So you're, again, you're giving the, the patient a chance to be involved in, in the complaint investigation to some extent. Then you're setting out your managing their expectations in the final paragraph. I hope to be able to respond to your complaint by such and such a date. I'll keep you updated of progress every two weeks and let you know if I think we won't be able to respond by the date. And again, that's being clear in your communication with the complainant. So acknowledgement is an opportunity uh, to be clear about what points will be investigated, to deal with issues of consent, because um, there are certain complaints in which you need to consider whether consent needs to be sought. So, for instance, if you're dealing with an elderly patient and you've got the children of elderly patients complaining about their care, um, you need to check whether those patients would like you to discuss their medical care with their family. And similarly, on the opposite end of the spectrum, you might be dealing with young people um, who may have um, may not want you to discuss the medical care that they've been receiving with their parents. That's particularly the thing with older, older, um, or you sort of say with teenagers, and perhaps not wanting to discuss how their their medical care has been or what medical care they've required. It's an opportunity to, to manage the expectations clearly, as we've seen here, in terms of when a response will be issued and agree what is reasonable. And again, this accords with what the uh, Parliamentary and Health Services and Ombudsman set out um, to be good complaint handling. And although, again, the PHSO is an English organisation, um, the same or very similar standards are set in Scotland and Wales and in Northern Ireland too. All of the Ombudsmen expect that you, as practices and as doctors, will listen carefully to what's being said, by the complainant, confirm their concerns and the issues to be investigated, ask the complainant what they wanted to achieve, to be achieved, can this be resolved straight away, manage their expectations, explain how long it will take, be open and realistic, agree with how they will be updated and what communication will take place, and explain what will happen next. So let's have a look at that complaint letter again and think about how we would approach that investigation. Um, in this case, I think getting an account from the receptionist would be useful, an account from the doctor involved, and a review of the clinical management, with reflections from the doctor and input from the complaint meeting and review. And I think this is a, a fundamental part of good complaint handling, whether you are in primary care or whether you're in secondary care. Patients want to be 
want to know that you're not handling it yourself as a doctor about who a complaint has been raised. They want to know that you have discussed it. They want to know that other people would have done the same or if not, what they might have done alternatively. They want to be aware of what the best practice guidelines are um, if they are available. And again, that, that accords with the second step of good complaint handling from the PHSO. Uh, as well as sharing your investigation plan before you start, they want you to be clear and transparent, uh, clear and transparent, including what evidence you're going to be looking at, who you will speak to, how you will evaluate that information that you've gathered, and you know, whether you how you will decide whether or not the care that is, was provided was appropriate or not and who will be involved in the decision making on whether or not the complaint is upheld within the practice or within the trust. And I think that is one of the important things to do, which is to demonstrate or be able to demonstrate as far as possible that you have looked at a complaint objectively, thinking about um, the idea of should versus did try to establish what you would have liked to have happened uh, in that particular consultation or the management of that patient versus what did happen and try to give equal weight to com to what the complainant says as to what your staff have said and I'll come on to that in a second. Try as well to, to show that you've um, applied objective criteria to determine clinical issues when you can. So, are there guidelines you can refer to? For instance, the NICE guidelines or the SIGN guidelines. Are there local guidelines? For instance, referral criteria that you can look at. Are there authoritative reference resources that you can refer to in your response or in your discussion with the patient, which they can then look at themselves to get a better understanding of, of what is expected of a doctor um, in that situation? Unfortunately, the sources of information from time to time will not agree. For instance, the patient or the family of a patient will say one thing and staff members will say something different. Hopefully, the records will support well, what staff say happened. And if that is the case, reference to the contemporaneous records of an interaction can be really helpful evidence of what actually occurred. Although some people may dispute what is recorded and some thought does need to be given to that, it is really helpful if the records back up um, what the staff say occurred. Sometimes, however, there is no specific record uh, of um, what has occurred. And in that instance, it's better to acknowledge doubt, indicating, for instance, what the person would normally do in that situation, saying something like, I haven't recorded it, but it would be my normal practice to do such and such. And if I didn't, in your case, I'm sorry. Ultimately, you can't always resolve strongly held opinions of what happened without information in the record or recorded in other ways, for instance, or on CCTV. All you can do is come to a reasonable judgment based on all of the information that you have with you. And if the two can't be reconciled, consider the value of a meeting to, to discuss uh, ongoing management of the complaint. So let's have a look at two, two um, responses. We've reviewed your complaint as a practice uh, and all the doctors agreed that they would have done the same thing as Dr. X when you attended in March. Now, that's a, a, a brief response to quite a detailed complaint, um, but it may be conveyed in, in a better way, perhaps. We've reviewed your care as a significant event to analyze whether we could have referred you under a two week wait earlier than we did in 2019. To do that, we've consulted the guidance on suspected bowel cancer, and then we've they've gone out to state what that guidance says. And when you, they then compared what the patient complained about, what the records say about their, their consultation with um, the NICE guidance and, and compared to these objective criteria. 
and that's quite a helpful thing to do to highlight the guidance to be clear about what they presented with and what what the patient um, what the guidance says about uh, the uh, their symptoms when they presented and this leads us on I think to actually writing that complaint response it's always helpful if it's appropriate to to make an apology early on in the letter saying sorry doesn't indicate that you agree with what the patient is saying or that you're admitting the fault but you can say sorry if the patient's expressed experience of their interaction with your service and that can be helpful we don't expect doctors to say sorry all the time but if it's appropriate it is a, it is a useful thing to do and it's something that gmc look for when they're reviewing complaint responses they also want to see expressions of empathy um, putting yourselves in the patient's position and understanding how it felt for them is a really important part of a, of a good response and again explaining how you have investigated the complaint in the in the response is really really helpful and then you want to give a factual account what happened explain in a way the patient will be able to understand respond to each point in the complaint and give your analysis this is often where complaint responses fall down people answer some of the issues that are raised in the complaint but not all of the issues raised in the complaint so it's a good idea when you get a complaint letter in to go through it and to highlight the individual issues within that complaint that do require a response if there are learning points or there are changes to what you are doing as an individual or what the practice is doing um, for instance as a whole then highlighting that for the complainant is really important and valuable it's important also to be clear about where the patient can go if they remain dissatisfied with the your complaint response and often that's a meeting with the the complainant um, we've got specific e-learning available on how to hold and to run a local resolution meeting um, and it's something you may want to look at but giving the patient somewhere to go short of the ombudsman or, or heaven forfend the gmc is a, is a useful um, uh, strategy because it makes it more likely that you're going to be able to resolve the issue in the in the complaint but you also do need to give um, details of the local or, or the relevant ombudsman for the patient to, to use should they remain unhappy. And again, that fits with um, step three of good complaint handling from the, from the ombudsman, um, making and sharing your decision. And they're very clear that they want responses from NHS providers to be clear and compassionate, to set out clearly what the issues were and what they want to achieve, how it had been addressed, what evidence has been looked at, how it has been considered, actions that you will take, and the fact that you have made it clear that they are able to go on to the ombudsman if they feel unhappy with um, your um, response. But there is a possibility, as I said, that they will not be happy. And before they go to the Ombudsman, you may need to hold um, a meeting. And when you're thinking about holding a meeting, it's important to set out what the meeting is going to achieve. You have to set out when it will happen in a mutually convenient time and make sure you give them enough time for them to discuss all of their concerns in an appropriate venue where you're not going to be going to be disturbed it's appropriate in advance to know who's going to be going and for them to know who's going to be there from the practice side whether it's a responsible person for complaints from the practice with somebody to take minutes um, that information should be communicated back to the complainant so that they understand what to expect. The notes of the meeting should be shared with both parties so there's a shared agreement and understanding of what was discussed and any action points that are due to follow on from that meeting 
should be um, should be uh, listed in the um, in the minutes that are shared and in the follow-up letter to the patient. So before a meeting, you know, it's the patient. It's important to contact the patient in order to consider what will be discussed, how long it's going to take, the appropriate venue, and who will be acting as chair. And after a meeting, you need to summarise the discussion in a letter, reiterate what the complainant can do if they remain dissatisfied, and um, that is an opportunity to mention the ombudsman um, of the jurisdiction in, in which you work. So in England and Wales, that would be the sorry, in England, it would be the Parliamentary and Health Services Ombudsman, where complainants can seek review of unresolved issues related to NHS funded care. The review will look at both clinical uh, issues and how you have handled that complaint. And the same can be said for the different ombudsmen in both Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. They are interested in how you have dealt with the complaint, not just the care provided. So trying to tie your responses and how you handle a complaint to what the ombudsman expects means that there's less likelihood that things are going to become, that you're going to be criticised as a practice by them for how you've managed something. There is usually an opportunity to comment on the uh, ombudsman's intention to investigate. So usually they'll let you know that they've heard of it, they've had a complaint and they intend to investigate. And prior to publication of their final report, they usually send a copy of the draft report to you for you to look at and to check for factual accuracy. And again, an that's an opportunity for you to pass comment on the on the complaint and on the how it's been handled. The recommendations from a complaint and the outcomes are either that they uphold it. Uh, in, in, in totality, they partially uphold it or they don't uphold it at all. And then if they uphold it, they can make recommendations around apologies and remedial actions expected of the practice or the trust if it's a hospital patient. And that can include financial remedy in, in England. So ombudsman's cases, if a complaint leaves the local resolution procedures and goes on to the Ombudsman, wherever you are in the United Kingdom, do remember to take advice because there are vulnerabilities associated with that. If you're in England, do remember to tell NHS Resolution about that and make sure that you have done uh, in your management of the complaint what you said you would do. It's, it's surprising how often we see complaints complaint responses that have been sent in which the practice or the doctors involved have not done the things that they said they would do. And at the time of the ombudsman review, the practice or the individual doctors realise they've not done what they said they planned to do, which is another area in which one can be criticised. So important to manage that uh, early and do, do what you said you are planning to do. So complaints are frequent, stressful and important. It's really important, of course, to communicate with the complainant, to investigate them objectively, to have a well-structured and thought-out response, to share the learning around a complaint, to plan appropriately for meetings and be very clear with patients about the next steps in management of their complaint. And these things, if done properly, will protect you as practices, as individual GPs, or indeed as hospital doctors. There are lots of resources available for um, com people who are having to handle complaints. Each ombudsman publishes information about complaint handling be that the, the PHSO or the, or the um, uh, Good Complaint Handling Guides from the other jurisdictions. In addition, we have a series of um, e-learning resources um, in the NDU available. There's one on, on local resolution modules. There's a, an e-learning module specifically on complaints, which has just been released 
and courses, in fact, on complaint handling that we run. And all of us as MLAs deal with complaints on a day-to-day -day basis. And we'd be really happy to assist any of our members with issues that come in uh, that they need to respond to. So please do make use of us if you're a member. We are here to help. On a related issue in terms of resources, I mentioned at the start that we have uh, webinars coming up on, on managing difficult complainants. And um, uh, I think I've cheekily called it patients behaving badly. That's coming up um, in the next couple of months. But next week, we've got one on the new GMC guidance, which has just come out on prescribing. And that's Wednesday, the 19th of May at seven o'clock in the evening. We've got a webinar on the new GMC prescribing guidance, which we'd be happy to talk to you about. And now I think we're probably ready for questions. I was planning to do some polling at the start of the meeting and I forgot to do it. So I apologize for that. But anyway, it'll give us more opportunity to try and address some of your questions. So why don't we why don't we look at that? Right. Hi, Nikki. Oops. And Ed. Have we got some questions to look at? Yes, Hi, Jared. We've got a, a lot of really interesting questions here. Um, shall I kick off by putting one to, uh, to you and Nikki? So I've got um, a a few themes here um, and the first one I want to bring out is a question about when um, when can you as a doctor say that the nature of complaints mean that, that the therapeutic relationship has broken down um, and I think we've got another one that follows on from that Nikki that you flagged up which is that you know if you're due to see a patient in, in, in the clinic and they've complained about you is it appropriate that you should see them what, what should you do in those circumstances? Okay, um, I'll take the, the, the second question there about whether it's appropriate to see them. I think that um, complaints are unfortunately a fact of life and uh, it's clear that the GMC would expect you to be maintaining your relationship with a patient even if there is a complaint about you. So um, the, the appropriate thing to do is if you know there's a complaint about you is to be professional about it, not let it impact upon how you are going to to manage that patient's care. And that, I think we alluded to that in that model response that they don't have to worry about how your um, how their care is going to be provided. What was the first one about a breakdown of relationships? Was that, was that the first part of the question, Ed? Sorry, I've lost you, your sound. What are, the, what are the sort of factors in a complaint that might evidence a breakdown in, in the relationship? Okay, I, I think that this kind of feeds into the idea of patients behaving badly. They come into the clinic room, they come in and start shouting the odds and threatening people. That's, that's obviously a red flag and that's not appropriate. No matter what the situation, staff have to be kept safe in their work environment. They don't come to work to be threatened. Um, that being said, um, there can be circumstances when one might expect somebody to make a particularly vituperative um, complaint um, about something that's very serious as that happened to them. And I think that to unilaterally decide that the relationship is broken down just because they are perhaps not as eloquent as one we might expect or express themselves in a professional manner that we would hope for. That's probably not a good enough reason just to say that's the end of it. It's better, I think, to, to separate the issue, the complaint, from the behaviour, deal with the complaint, and then go on to address the behaviour, whether that's with a warning to say that really wasn't appropriate. On such and such date, you came into practice. This is how you behaved. That's not, not appropriate. And if that is repeated, we will remove you from the list. Um, rather than saying, this is your response to your complaint, and by the way, we've removed you from the list because our relationship is broken down. That's yeah. the sort of thing that's more likely, I think, to end in an in a issue with the ombudsman. I think we just also have to think a little bit about if there's any sort of mitigating clinical condition that the patient might have yeah, as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because obviously there are individuals who have might have be have a preponderance to certain behaviour or have perhaps say an underlying addiction, which means 
they become increasingly stressed and angry when they're trying to get hold of opiate medications and that does need to be an understanding of those mitigations and to try and treat those underlying clinical conditions whilst dealing with the complaint separately. Um, so I, I don't think you can necessarily always say there's been a breakdown in relationship if you haven't tried to address the clinical conditions themselves which have led to I, agree. I, I think the fundamental thing is to make sure that if you're if the for instance a practice or the trust is going to be reviewed by an external body will can they be demonstrated to have acted reasonably in the circumstances that's what's important um, that you can demonstrate because you sometimes you won't make somebody happy in how you in, in whatever you write in your complaint response but if it's going to be reviewed by an external body an external party and that's always a risk as we as i tried to show in that multiple jeopardy slide um, you want to make sure that your response is, is temperate, professional, appropriate, addresses all the issues and isn't seen to be unreasonable uh, in dealing with the um, complainant. Ed, do you have anything you want to add to that? Sorry, it's, it's just to say, I, I think that's absolutely right. This can be quite frustrating, but whenever whenever you end a professional relationship yes there might be some absolute absolute um, red lines that are crossed that means the relationships at an end but otherwise you're trying to show what you've done to try and resolve the issues that you've agreed kind of how things will go with the patient and and when that's failed yes it may be perfectly reasonable to to, to move things on and we've had a lot of questions about whether it's okay for, a, for the patient to be allocated to a colleague um, and, and that, you know, with mutual agreement, that's absolutely fine. If, if, if the patient prefers to see someone else, if you think that's a, a better idea and it can be facilitated, um, that, that's absolutely fine. Yeah, I, I yeah. agree with that. Absolutely. Um, so we've got some other questions coming in. Um, I suppose with the advent of COVID, there's been a lot of telephone conversations going on and telephone consultations. Um, there's a question about keeping telephone um, consultations on record. If you anticipate a, uh, a complaint, is, is that a helpful thing to do? What are your thoughts on that? Well, Ed, I can see you. You're about to go there, please. Yeah, I was going to say it's it's a it's a question that I've come across quite quite recently, and and obviously most call recording systems will maintain the record recordings for a period of time. The most pressing thing where this this bites is really when you get a complaint, the recordings there but might be imminently automatically deleted. I think in that setting it is really important to secure it because listening to the complaint recording might be a very important part of the investigating the, the complaint. Um, if you anticipate a complaint, I don't think it's wrong to keep that, that recording in case that happens, uh, but you've probably got to apply a reasonable time scale for, for, for keeping that rather than keeping it indefinitely um, if that's not your usual policy for, for call recordings. So. So do you mean um, like and, the Protection Act? Um, exactly. And the other thing to say is often patients now are very aware calls are recorded and they will ask for these recordings. Mm. And usually that's quite helpful um, to the clinicians, I have to say, in, in our experience, that it actually does show something that's, um, that, that, that um, it gives some objective information and it, and it perhaps um, sets things out slightly differently from the way that, that, that the patient may have perceived them. Okay. Absolutely. There's a quick question as well. Um, what what is the maximum time for a response? Query three weeks. So um, it, it's not set out in law, at least in England, it's not set out in in um, the guidance. Um, so three weeks uh, would seem to be a relatively a relatively reasonable time frame for a straightforward complaint. But sometimes complaints can take a lot longer. I think the important thing is to make sure that people. Are updated now. Obviously, in in Scotland and Wales and in Northern Ireland, there are specific timeframes for for responding to complaint. But in England, there isn't a specific time frame. The important thing is to make sure you're clear about it in, in terms of your communication with your patient. Yeah, I think um, keeping people updated if if there's going to be a delay to response. Certainly, in general practice, we often see with the use of locums perhaps people going on maternity leave, it, it can be difficult to get a, a coordinated response with multiple doctors involved. So yes, be careful when you uh, sort of set the expectations out in your letter of acknowledgement as to when you're going to give your response. 
if it's a really complicated complaint and you've got a lot of different clinicians involved, then useful to, to give yourself a fair bit of leeway, but also keep those patients updated as the complaint investigation goes forward. On a, on a related point, sorry, you've, you've hit upon something that's, that's quite important and often seems to cause problems, is that when, you're, when you've got lots of people involved and some of those people have moved on, to different jobs, be that rotating in the hospital to something else, or they were locums and they're not in the practice anymore, they have to be involved as well if that's possible. They have to be able to look at what they've done, they have to be involved in the reflection and if possible in meetings about things. Um, what's, because if you look at it from their point of view, what the last thing they want to do is to hear about something that's been discussed and decided upon and responded to and they don't agree with the response because there's a fundamental piece of information that's just not included in the record or that they feel very strongly that it should be communicated in the response as well. So it's always difficult, I think, particularly for practice managers managing um, locums and such like uh, to, to make sure you've contacted everybody and that includes retired people, but it is a, it is a requirement uh, of um, good complaint management. So, Jared, there's a really interesting um, comment here that relates to what you said about apologies, and um, I'll read it out in full to say our complaints department feel that too many complaints now begin with an apology, and this uh, is now detracting from apologies that need to be made arising from the complaint. Is this fair? Can you over-apologise, and does this distract from an apology that needs to be made at the end of the complaint? That's that's quite a difficult one. Um, I haven't seen many examples of over apologising. Um, if I am being honest, it's usually the other way that there is no apology in in the complaint at all. So that may be an individual within a complaints department noticing that. Um, I, I think it's also important to to be clear that there's 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 very few downsides to saying sorry when something has gone wrong. But I accept that there are circumstances in which it's really appropriate to say sorry, and in that circumstance you certainly should. So if there's nothing to say sorry about, if nothing has been nothing has been done wrongly, and, and, the, and particularly as a clinician or as a team involved in the patient's care, if you don't think it's appropriate to say sorry, that's fair enough. Mm -hmm. um, and that I think nobody's going to make anybody, certainly from our point of view, we wouldn't be demanding an apology if it were not appropriate to do so. Um, I do realise that it is a sort of thing we say a lot, we make sure you put an apology in, but if it's not appropriate, we, we wouldn't be say, telling you to do it. The one caveat I would say with that is that it has to be a genuine apology and there's there's nothing worse than saying sorry and it not sounding as if you're sorry. So it, it has to be an, a genuine expression of, of sorrow, I think, within that matter. Oh. I think that's really hit the nail on the head, Nikki, and that I could I could see the complaints department's perspective if there is a generic paragraph that goes in every letter saying yeah. sorry, that Absolutely. there might be a better way to express empathy to say, look, you know, I'm really sorry that you've had a really difficult year. We know you've had lots of problems with this. And, and I know that, you know, being frustrated about your care doesn't help. I'm going to try and explain it, you know, what happened. Mm -hmm you know, rather than just a generic apology at the end, if you can make it meaningful and tailor it to the patient, I'd agree that there's very little downside. But if the observation is, look, don't just say generically, I'm sorry, and have the same paragraph for every letter, I think we'd all agree with that, that, that there is a better way to approach it than that. Okay. Um, so let's, let's have a look at what else we've got here. Shall I do this one? I handle complaints, I'm going to read this out again in, in full, I handle complaints from my department, so I'm answering complaints on behalf of colleagues, often having not been involved in the care. I dread the resolution meetings, it means I'm getting involved in issues in a more personal way to a written response. Overall, would it be better to designate complaints to the responsible consultant? Okay, that, that's, a, that's a, a challenging one. Um, and I, I, I do understand uh, the, the difficulty there because often these meetings can be can be very heated. Obviously, an involved consultant or involved GP has to be involved in, in complaint management, but they don't have to be the person running the, the meeting, uh, as you're alluding to, I think, um, there. Um, personally, if there has to be a, a local resolution meeting and um, it's often better if it is not being run by the person 
about whom the complaint is being made. I think then th 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 people tend to become a little bit more defensive when they're the one who's being complained about uh, and running the meeting. It's often better if a senior, if possible, trusted colleague who's looking at it reasonably and fairly is involved. I recognise that doesn't always happen. But no, I, I personally wouldn't think it'd be better that the involved person is running that meeting, but they should certainly be involved in that meeting. Does anybody else have anything to add to that? No, I, I agree that there should be a, a, a neutral chair, shall we say, to, to those types of meetings who can uh, be advocate both to the, the clinician and to the patient themselves. But obviously there has to be involvement of the clinician involved as well, or certainly the, the, the chair has to have a very good knowledge of, of what has happened um, in, in the events that led up to the complaint. Um, and so, you can't, the doctor involved can't not be involved, I don't think. Ed, what, what's your thought? Yeah, and I think so. And I think this also illustrates um, the position that some doctors have where they're, they're kind of involved in dealing with the complaint but weren't involved in the care. And I guess yeah. one of the things that, that Jared was emphasising with the with this presentation is that there are really two things here. There's the, the clinical care and then there's the skill of handling the complaint and making sure it's properly investigated, that the meetings are properly run, that the right people are involved, etc. And I guess that's your role if you're handling the complaint. Uh, and actually some distance can sometimes help um, the complainant actually you know understand that it's been investigated with a degree of independence yeah I think it goes the same way when you're, you're signing a letter for signing a letter for instance for a practice um, it's always helpful if it can be signed off by the responsible person for the practice which is what should happen so it's not perhaps the doctor who was directly involved as long as it's clear they've been involved in the response but it's signed off by somebody else which can, it makes it clear that somebody else has been involved in reviewing the issues that are raised in this complaint so there's another theme here that i want to bring out because i know we're, we're, we're close to time and this is a, a recurrent one is how do we manage complaints when the complaint is is a serial complainer and particularly yeah. with a slant that they want to effectively push the doctor or the practice to a particular outcome, say a, a prescription for a controlled drug or or whatever, an opioid prescription, or, or wants to have medication issued without review and coming up. How do we deal with those situations? Nikki, do you want to go for that one or do you want me to? <laughs> I'm happy for you to chip in, but uh... right, um, for whatever. I mean, I think this the important thing in, in that circumstance is, be, is being being reasonable and being uh, be able to evidence that you're following guidance and you're doing it appropriately, involving a second person for another opinion. Um, and if you're getting serial complaints on the same point, um, making sure that politely pointing out to the patient that this has already been responded to, and you can read our response in our letter of X. Um, uh, if you are getting somebody who is making repeated complaints on the same point, I don't think you have to engage in and giving the same answer repeatedly. I think if you are getting somebody who's just not happy with the fact that you won't do what they want, you can say, we haven't done what you want for these reasons. This is the guidance we're following. We've answered your complaints on X, Y, and Z. And you might even get the point of saying, um, we understand that this is an important point for you. We think we've answered this. We think you are being unreasonable. And if you continue to complain in this vein, um, we may uh, have to uh, warn you about your behaviour and ultimately remove you, for instance, from the list. And I think that, that you know, you're often dealing with different issues and just be reassured that that just because someone has complained, it doesn't mean you have to do what they want. The, the purpose of why we're putting information about this is to really try and give you the confidence to be able to effectively and objectively investigate those concerns. You know a complaint response you put out, say, about prescribing, etc., is properly evidenced, properly references guidance, and you can stand by it. And, and then if, if, say, it's a patient with drug-seeking behaviour, you can write to them separately to say, look, we want to help you with this. This is what we think is going on and this is how we propose to manage it. Now, clearly, they may not like it, but you are objectively doing the right thing. Uh, yeah. And we see just as many complaints about, you know, opioids where, where a doctor hasn't really picked up on drug-seeking behaviour and proactively managed it. So, I think that really illustrates why getting the complaint investigation right is important because it lets you deal with those other issues as well. 
Absolutely. I agree with that. Really running close to time. There are a few quick fire ones here that, that we may do quickly at the end, but there's there's one other theme that I want to put to both of you, which is uh, about how do you deal with those slightly subjective complaints about the doctor not feeling sympathetic or empathetic, etc. How, how do you deal with those sorts of things in a response? Those are difficult ones, aren't they? Because how can you prove empathy? Um, I, certainly, you equally. I mean. The difficulty is when the patient says you weren't empathetic towards me, you can't argue with that in the complaint response because it's a subjective thing, isn't it? So you can apologise that they did not find you to be empathic, and, but explain that that wasn't your intention and explain what your intentions were within that consultation. You were trying to find out more information to work your way towards a diagnosis and then to be able to offer treatment. So it's, it's really about saying, I'm sorry that that's how you found me. This is what I was intending to do. And, and that would be the way that I would approach a, a complaint response in, in that sort of yeah. situation. I agree with that. Absolutely. And and uh, picking up on what you said there, Nikki, actually setting out what was done for the patient, the detail of the thought that went in can kind of help give some reassurance of that. Um, so a few quick fire ones here to say, um, oh, yes, if, if, if a person wants to complain about another doctor who, the name they can't remember, but whose name is in the records, can you provide that information to the patient? So you know the information recordings in the records is about the patient doctors don't get some sort of third party you know anonymity in that circumstance so it's reasonable to say i can see that you saw dr x on that occasion that's that's completely reasonable and they'd be entitled to the information anyway if they were to do a subject access request of their own records under the data protection act so the short answer is yes what you can't do is say yes that was terrible behavior or no, I, I would never have done anything like that which we sometimes surprisingly do see. So be professional, don't criticise the other person, but yes, you can certainly share that information with the patient. Another quick one, should we tell patients that we're getting help from the MDE when we're responding to their complaint? So that's a, that is actually a really interesting question. And, and we do like, we do want um, our practices, for instance, to be clear that they may end up sharing some information um, with third parties, for instance, like, the def like their defence organisations. That being said, generally, when you're getting advice on a complaint in the NHS, we don't need that person's personal data. You can anonymise the information that you send to us and we can still advise you on it. So um, it's, you, you will share some information. You don't have to tell them you're sharing information with us specifically, um, particularly if that's anonymised information. But it's often not unusual to say that we're just taking some advice on the response and um, we'll get back to you when we've got the, got the advice. Um, and a couple of quick things really relating to COVID. The first one was whether we've seen, um, you know, a particular bout of COVID related complaints. Um, I've got some thoughts. Have any of you guys got any observations on that? I think my own personal experience is that I've seen quite a large number of complaints coming from patients in particular about not being seen in person um, and the yeah. suggestion that if perhaps they had been seen in in person their diagnosis could have been picked up sooner that seems to be a recurring theme that i'm seeing i don't know about you two what about what's your experience well i think christine Tompkins, the chief executive said as much uh, quite recently i'm sorry ed what were you going to say sorry you're quiet no, no, ed. I was just agreeing so please please carry on no, I, th I think that uh, the chief executive said that the, the, she's been aware of an increased increasing frequency of complaints around around COVID, and we've certainly seen as individual advisors a, a change in in the type of complaints that we're seeing. So we do see we are seeing complaints that are quite specific to the um, current situation, um, although albeit that they they cover much the same ground that we've always seen in complaints. I don't think that I don't think there's anything new coming in. It's just done a different way. I think that's a, a, an interesting point, isn't it, in that it's hard to know whether these, you know, because often the difficult, the delayed diagnoses are the ones that are classically delayed and difficult. We've yeah. obviously seen some mask wearing complaints. And I just want to turn on this final point, because I know it's an issue out there that, that um, I've got a comment here saying that 
patients are perhaps becoming increasingly frustrated, making sort of personal attacks on on staff to say, look, if I don't get this today and it, I, my daughter dies, it's your fault, etc. Um, and, and the thing to say is, look, if people are complaining, yes, you manage the complaint. It doesn't stop you managing that behavior. If you record the behavior, log it, give proper detailed warnings, explaining how are you going to manage their complaint and their frustration, but also explaining why it's, it's not appropriate that they speak to your staff about that. Um, yeah. You know, I think that's that that's really important. You, you're not you're not required to take abuse on a day to day basis without doing anything about it. Absolutely. And just on that point, I know we're about to finish. Just to say quickly, in terms of where you're going to re re record that information, that sort of information ideally go into a, an incident form about something that's happened. You might put health-related information in the record. You wouldn't put a verbatim account of a difficult patient um, shouting at shouting at the receptions into the health records, because it's not specifically a health-related issue, but you would record information, you'd gather information in your investigation from other people. Um, in the reception area as well. So um, that would be a, a data, an incident form rather than the health records. I, I it feeds quite nicely into, as I said, we are going to have a specific webinar um, about managing um, when patients behaving badly, if you will. I, I think that title is going to stick now, Ed. I know you didn't like it. I think it will stick. I think that's us, isn't it? So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.